Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Raymond Peterson. I'm Bob Anthony. And I'm Alan Singer. Educator, historian, Dr. Alan Singer, our resident expert on Media Watch. Happy to have you with us. We're doing this uh, Tuesday, I think July 2nd. And July 2nd. Yeah. We will hopefully have it up on MNN next Monday, 5.30. It will definitely be up on YouTube and maybe Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> we'll let you folks know. But um, so post-mortem, uh, let's jump right in and deal with an uh, update on the 2024 presidential election cycle and how things are going since the debate. And uh, so, Ray, before we hit here, we, you mentioned that there were dueling newspaper accounts on who should get out and who should stay in the race. <laughs> yep. Philadelphia Inquirer, the only the only one I've seen so far. I mean, I haven't heard any, I haven't heard anything from the Times, uh, the Washington Post. Uh, the Times oh, actually maybe. said Joe Biden should get out of the race. Philadelphia Inquirer said Donald oh. Trump should get out of the race. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our dueling newspaper headlines right there. <laughs> uh, but my take is bad debate performance doesn't make necessarily the end of the campaign for Joe Biden, but the Democrats seem to have totally freaked out. So, Alan, you want to jump in on how bad the freak out is? I know you understand why they freaked out so you can put their freak out in perspective and then bob you can comment on that <laughs> go ahead Alan. look we all saw the debate and it wasn't much of a debate big problem and uh commentators who even paid attention said you know trump just lied the whole it, it was bluster and lie but the problem was that joe biden came across very badly he came across as an old man who was not able to do the job any longer. Uh, you know, raspy throat and cough, well, that's a cold. But what appeared to me is that he had tried to memorize really complex ideas he was going to show he was on top of his game. And then what happened during the course of the debate, he couldn't remember his lines. So he came across just pausing and stu stuttering and, and lost. And I'm watching that. And I know that over the last four years, I think he's done a surprisingly effective job. I think he's the strongest president we've had really since Lyndon Johnson, but in, in terms of getting accomplishments. But I'm watching this. I'm saying he really should not be running for president anymore. He needs to, to withdraw. So, Bob. It, so that, those yeah. are just your take, on, your take on the performance and then the next day, Bob. <laughs> I mean, uh, I agree. It, it was a, a a very bad performance. And Alan is right. They tried to put too many facts in his head. And you know how, people, uh, how you get when you're arguing with somebody and you're trying to make a point. The other person says something and all of a sudden you've lost track of what you were about to say. Biden had multiple cases of that. He was trying to get a complex fact out. And instead of just being Joe Biden, which is the best thing he could have done that day, he tried to be Mr. Intellectual rattling off all these facts as if it was a moot court, you know, as if this was this was an academic debate. This was not an academic debate. This was one where you were supposed to show that you can do the job and this guy's lying. And that's all he needed to get across that day. And he did not. So uh, I was surprised by the uh, knee-jerk reaction of so many newspapers, including the Times. But then again, after, ever since Joe Kahn has taken the helm of the New York Times, I've, I've lost a little faith in that paper. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, it, it was a bad uh, performance. Should he withdraw, we have no one to, play, to replace him with. My hope for him, if he gets reelected, is that he can do the job because he won't have to campaign. He can spend all his time working and not traveling and debating and campaigning. So that's that's right. what might help him make it through term two, but he is getting really old. 
yeah, he's getting he's getting old. But the you know, the other thing you have to remember, and, and Eric, you're right. He should have stayed home and practiced for this debate. But what in reality, he crossed. Like I believe it was four time zones in a matter a matter of days before the debate came down with that cold. So physically, no one could have stood up to that. You know, and his age played his age played a factor. And you're right; he had too many facts in his head that he was trying to get out. Uh, I noticed that his stutter came out a little bit, and that would tend to slow somebody down as well. Uh, but like I said, and you, we've all said actually, uh, Biden's got the most experience. He's been in Congress longer than almost anybody, and um, he's he's pulled himself out. He's he's been down before. I'm not I'm not counting him out yet. I, I was I was horrified at the debate. Yeah. But then I started to think, you know, listen, that's a knee jerk reaction. Of course, it was a horrible debate. It, it actually was. There's no denying that. But that doesn't mean that the man is unable to do the job. Yeah, I, I got two points on that. I agree with you that it was a terrible. I agree with everybody that <laughs> terrible debate performance. And yeah, he he all he had to do instead of trying to come out with all those facts about his record and all that was just push back at Trump's statements about 18 million people coming across the board and say, oh, really? Where'd you pull that number? You should, you should pull that number out of your rear end. That's his response, <laughs> just to say. That's, that's your way of saying that's a lie because that's all Trump did all night was lie, lie, lie. All he had to say was, oh, you pulled another one out of your rear end. Another big lie. You can't just come out with facts about your record when a guy is throwing a ton of lies at the wall, hoping one of them will stick. You got to just blow it back in his face. But two things. It's going to be hard to dispel that image. But he went a long ways to dispelling it the very next day at his rally in, I think, North Carolina, one of the Carolinas. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. North Carolina, was it? The next day? He was at a rally in mm -hmm. the Carolinas. One I'm not sure Carolinas. where. Yeah, uh, yeah, I saw, I saw the Carolinas. Of the rally, but I'm not and sure. Yeah, and, and it made Carolina. made the Democrats feel a lot better because the Biden that should have been on the stage on the Thursday night, previous Thursday for the debate, showed up for the rally. But even if he can pull this campaign out from a bad debate performance, which based on his record, Alan, you said something that I'd totally forgotten. For effectiveness, he's probably been the most effective president since Lyndon Johnson about legislation that's been passed that's been good for the American public, including jobs created, bringing unemployment down, a whole bunch of metrics that seems to have gotten lost by the Democrats freaking out because the worst thing about the debate performance was just how crazed the Democrats got by such a terrible performance. They totally lost it, most of them. And it took a while for some of the high profile Democrats to come back, circle the wagon and say, no, this is our guy. Because there's all this talk about we need a new candidate. He needs not to be here. And it's going to cause you can't do that. That's an undivided front when you need to have, that's a divided front when you need to have an undivided front going up against a bunch of lies and a bunch of craziness because the craziness is even getting worse talking about this recent Supreme Court ruling where all of a sudden this guy who's already a 64 count convicted felon has just been told he's above the law by the United States Supreme Court. This ruling that just came down that's got everybody and uncle scratching their heads because basically he has, this court has granted this guy, even with all the delays, 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 their ruling that supposedly parsing his immunity isn't parsing it at all. They basically said he's above the law. Alan, as a historian, I need for you to dissect the oh. fact that they quote, didn't give him total immunity, but in actuality, they did. Look, I think this is the worst Supreme Court decision since Dred Scott in 1857. And there have been a lot of bad ones. 
but I don't even call it the Supreme Court anymore. I call it the extreme court. What we have is a collection of injustices who operate based on their ideological biases. They decide what they want, and then they try to find legal grounds to justify it. And there isn't any consistency in what they do. So what they've said is they've created an impossible standard. They, what they've said is that uh, if an action is part of your job as the president, you have immunity. If your action is not part of your job as a president, you don't. Well, this is the problem. Trump claims that everything he did was part of his job as president. The rally where he incited the rioters who then invade the Capitol building, his argument is that he was defending election integrity. His argument for uh, calling up electors and setting up phony election stuff, oh, I was trying to defend election integrity. That's my job as president. Well, if that's the standard, you can break any law you want. If you believe it was part of your job as the president, there's no way to hold any president accountable. Yeah, based on that ruling, I, I, you know, I'm going to call up the dissent. There were three dissents, of course, mm -hmm. all well written, but Sonia so, Sotomayor mm -hmm. uh, had a great dissent. I'm going to quote her dissent. In uh, the I have it here, if you like. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Re uh, I mean, writing that the majority was deeply wrong, Justice Sonia Sotomayor added that beyond its consequences for the bid to prosecute Mr. Trump for his attempt to subvert the outcome of the 2020 election, it would have stark long-term consequences for the future of American democracy. Now, do you want me to uh, quote the part about the Navy SEAL team? Yep, quote the whole thing. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the, 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 the court effectively creates a law-free zone around the president, upsetting the status quo that has existed since the founding, she wrote, uh, and joined by uh, Justice uh, Elena K Kagan and Katanji Brown Jackson. Let me skip through to the other half of the quote. Orders the, uh, imagine if the president orders the Navy SEAL Team 6, orders the Navy SEAL Team Navy SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? Immune. Organizes a military coup to hold on to power? Immune. Takes bribe in exchange for a pardon? Immune, 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 she wrote, adding, even if these nightmare scenarios never play out, and I pray they never do, the damage has been done. The relationship between the president and the people he serves has shifted irrevocably. This is an awesome dissent basically slapping the majority in the face. And generally in dissents, you don't slap that hard. She basically called out Chief Justice John Roberts, basically addressed him for that particular ruling. And his response was, the dissent is being overwrought. That was his take on her dissent. They're, they were overwrought. <laughs> yeah, right. Basically, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but based on the Declaration of Independence and parts yeah. of the Constitution that supposedly enshrined no person in the United States of America is above the law, this Supreme Court has just kicked that out the window for generations to come unless somebody can reverse that. Look, they claim they respect precedents. Every one of them at their hearing said, oh, I respect precedents. They have wiped out 800 years of legal precedence. In the 1200s in Great Britain, the nobility and what can be known as the Magna Carta forced the king to accept that the king was had to follow the law, that no one was above the law. When the United States was set up, it adopted the British legal system. So it adopted those precedents. And in the declaration, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. Well, what this court has done is they said, no, there's one person 
who is not equal, who is not bound by the law. That's a medieval king. That's a dictator. That is a, Sotomayor is right. They have wiped out one of the great strengths of a democratic society. And I am really scared if this character gets elected. Yeah, okay. But they, they came down with a bunch of crazy rulings in the last week, not to mention Roe v. Wade yeah. years ago. So the bottom line is, is it two years now? Was it just two? It's two years since they wiped out Roe v. Wade. Yeah, okay, two years. Um, but they just came down with a ruling that one, bent over backwards to say that the rioters did not impede with the functioning of the federal government by saying the obstruction of justice clause that they used to prosecute those folks, a charge that Donald Trump would also be up on, by the way, mm -hmm. his next trial, if it ever comes to be. They just said, oh no, if you didn't stop a document, alter a document, rip up a document, you were not obstructing the pursuant of uh, government activity that you were that was being obstructed. You you could you could stand in front of the door, block the people from going in to take the votes, and you couldn't be charged with obstructing the federal proceedings because you didn't touch a document based on that ruling. Okay, so they came down with that ruling that's going to throw out a bunch of cases that people got convicted on using that charge. And then they passed a ruling that said the EPA can't do crap about clean water, clean air, uh, uh, about setting pollution rules for egg, uh, auto exhaust, yeah. any of the things that the, quote, administrative functioning part of the federal government where people with experts could come up with a ruling that would protect the environment. If Congress doesn't specifically have a law that says that what they say is what should be done, it doesn't stand anymore. So the EPA is basically gutted, unless I'm misinterpreting. Yeah. No, I, I mean, other agencies as well. Every yeah. other agency is, is losing its power. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Oh, no, no, I have no, 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 no. Yeah. Go ahead. On the obstruction thing. So someone goes into the bank and you know, they got a gun and everything and they're going in to rob the bank and they get all the money and they put it in their bag and then on the way out, they get caught. Well, if they get caught on the way out, they technically didn't rob the bank because the money never left. So we couldn't bring them up on bank robbery charges under this interpretation because they failed to block the count. It was an obstruction. And I mean, basically, they ruled that apparently what they needed to do was to break through that last glass wall, the one that the woman got shot trying to breach, and enter the uh, the room where the legislators were being held. And as soon as they tore one edge of one document, then that would have been obstruction. But according to this interpretation, everything they did before that didn't rise to the level, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, how about assaulting the um, the, the Capitol Police? That wasn't but, assaulting a, a federal, getting in the way of stopping a federal procedure. <laughs> that, that that wasn't obstructing a, a oh, federal procedure. That, that was that was criminal. I mean, just plain out criminal. Oh, okay. But but, but hey, Alan was saying before we went on air about how this court takes an issue, figures out a, and figures out a way to spin it to the right wing uh, conservative narrative and tries to invent something. And just quickly, remember the, the bump stock ruling? They oh. ruled that a bump stock gun is not a machine gun. Now the law is there to prevent people from using rapid fire weapons uh, indiscriminately. That's what the law was intended to protect, but they used the word machine gun in the law. So mm -hmm. the court figured that, well, it's not Technically, a machine gun. Never mind that it fires almost as fast. Yes, if it it actually fires almost as fast and it has the exact same effect, but they said, well, it's not specifically a machine gun, so no, it doesn't count. This has been a terrible court, Alan, and you're right. 
Alan, isn't that isn't that part of what the Chevron uh, law did in, in, in terms of leaving it to the experts? So in the Chevron doctrine, this is a continuation of that thinking. Yes. Yeah. They, yeah. They, and, and so that was the first assault, successful assault, trying to gut the EPA. And all these new rulings now are going to fall into place. Yes, you're right about that. Yeah. So, I, uh, you know, um, it's the the whole bit about this court being extreme. I heard somebody say, "Well, the Warren Court was extreme as far as the country was concerned when the Warren Court decided they were going to end." <laughs> school segregation, yeah. when the Warren Court ruled all kinds of things that, quote, were in the liberal camp that people had been living with since the 19th century, right? But, and they used to call the Warren Court an activist court, all yeah. right? That's where the activist court term first came into play, because the Warren Court finally tried to correct a lot of the imbalances that the country had been perpetrating since the 19th century, as far as race, segregation, uh, whatever, okay? But it was activist in the sense of being morally correct, judiciously, <laughs> judicially correct, and actually trying to live up to the constitution that was written to safeguard all those things that had been denied in the previous year. This court, activist court in its own way, does not seem to be trying to one act in a morally just way, because if you will let bump stocks continue to proliferate and kill people in mass shootings, you're certainly not thinking about the moral impact of your judgment. It, I don't think it's morally correct in its gutting of the EPA if you will allow corporate polluters to do what they want to do. In fact, the court's gotten so bad that before an act is actually in place now, they have come down with rulings. But there was a case where there was a rule that says, good neighbor policy, you can't have toxic emissions flying across your state into another state. And the EPA said, that is not good. We're going to pass a ruling that says you can't do that. Before they could even put that into effect, this court had come out with a ruling saying, you can't even make that rule. Hasn't been to court yet. Hasn't been tried or challenged yet. They have come out with a rule before the case has even gotten into a court. So when you talk about an activist court, not necessarily within the context of doing what's best for the American public, because definitely pollution rolling across state, like acid rain used to roll across. You, 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 if you're going to rule in favor of letting all that happen, letting kids get killed, letting people die, then yeah, you're an activist court on the side of big business, because all that is gun lobby stuff, corporate lobbying stuff, all that stuff my estimation, that's my humble opinion, but these rulings all seem to side against the general public and for corporate entities. Libertarian corporate business structures, gun lobbying, corporate NRA business structures, all these rulings from this court seem to all fall into that camp. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I mean, historically, Intra interstate pollution, pollution that goes from one state to the other, has always been. They've been trying hard to manage that. Milwaukee had to rebuild their entire sewer system because Chicago sued them, and they had to separate the sewers into sanitary and because everything was going into Lake Michigan, and Chicago was getting it. You know, they it, so there's there's a public, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's important to the public to have regulations like this. But uh, I think you're about to say something, Alan. Yeah, in, I think it was 1984, William Brennan was uh, a, a justice on the Supreme Court. And what Brennan said was the Constitution is a guide, 
but we have to interpret it as modern individuals. The situations we face, like pollution, are not issues that the founding fathers had to address. What they created in the Constitution was a process for addressing issues as they came up, but they never pretended that the future was going to have to do what they were doing at the time. We now have the Supreme Court, which is basically negated 200 years. They're pretending that we're living in uh, the, the 18th century instead of in the 21st century. And 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 it's with that, disaster. we have, I'm sorry, just, uh, no, just, giving, just giving the two-minute warning. Go ahead. And I think I really worry. I worry that if Donald Trump is elected, this court will never intervene to uh, place limits on the things that he does. But also the nation is so divided in the House and in the Senate that uh, things will not be able to be passed. We will be unable to address the problems that emerge. That was why so many of the problems were done through administrative decisions because uh, they couldn't get through the House and the Senate. Well, if we take that away, we have crippled our country. Well, in the little time that we have left, the 2024 election is going to be significant. And just to tag it, uh, big money keeps rolling into local elections. A lot of money got pumped into the New York primary for uh, Representative Bowman's seat. And so he went down in a crashing defeat. He was one of the progressive squads who would be trying to help stuff about curtailing air pollution, water pollution, clean water, making sure we had clean water and stuff. But he also shot himself in the foot a number of ways and a number of times and not understanding his entire district. And so, yeah, but I think a lot of outside money helped torpedo him. The rest of the squad, the progressive folks who keep fighting the good fight, or try to, they're also targeted by big money and corporate interests who don't like the fact that they're trying to curtail a lot of these big business. And basically- And, and we're just about there. That's basically it. We got to, folks, get out and vote. <laughs> this has been yeah. me watching. Definitely. Host, Eric Tate. Raymond Peterson. Alan Singer. And I'm Bob Anthony. Follow us on YouTube at Media Watch EVT. And we'll catch you the next time, folks. Stay safe.